Now we approach a very important topic for, uh, in our conference. It's about how can we make that important teaching of the sanctuary relevant for our times. So the title of my presentation today is about the relevance of the sanctuary in postmodernism. I will start with a few introductory remarks and I will use one of the slides that I use at the very beginning of the centrality of sanctuary in the Bible when I presented uh, a few days ago. When we talk about sanctuary ritual, we refer to three parts. We refer to the building itself, we refer to the sacrificial system, and also we do refer to the priesthood. All together, they form what we call sanctuary ritual. And uh, I put on my slide, 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, since this verse put those three parts together. So when we approach the sanctuary material in Pentateuch and forward, we'll meet again and again with those three components of the sanctuary ritual. Now, I brought this up because I want to focus in my presentation today not on the sacrificial system, neither on the priesthood, but in my focus today, I will refer, uh, my focus today is to refer to the objects or to the spaces in the sanctuary and how do they interplay with the objects in the tent of meeting. The second methodological observation that I will make before I will present my topic, it's related about the, the way we will interpret the sanctuary objects. For that, I won't jump into New Testament or in other books of the Old Testament, but I will keep myself into the very book where the sanctuary, where the building, where the objects were revealed. So, in order to apply uh, the very well-known uh, hermeneutical principle to remain into the context, for us, Exodus represents the immediate context. Larger context will be Pentateuch, and larger biblical context will refer there to the canonical books. And looking at certain objects, uh, of the sanctuary, we'll figure out some important meanings for, uh, for our life today. My presentation has three parts, and we will deal in the first part with sanctuary as a drama. In the second part, we will discuss sanctuary as a journey, and in the last part, we will deal with sanctuary as a repository of memories. And in the following, I will take one by one and I will try to develop my thoughts uh, progressively. When we refer to sanctuary as a drama, we have to look into the most holy place and there we refer especially about the most important thing that sanctuary was hosting. God's presence and the Ark of the Covenant. When we will discuss then about the holy place, I will focus in this part of my presentation about uh, on the candlestick and the table. And in the courtyard, I will refer in this part of my presentation on the, on the altar of burnt offerings. Now, if you as a pastor will be asked by a teenager to say, what is going on in the most holy place? How would you describe what is there? Or to make it more, let's say, close to our young people who are teenagers, if we imagine 
uh, teenager today, perhaps with some jeans, some cuts on their jeans, and then with a t-shirt, a skull maybe there, he is somehow trying to impress or to say that it's atypical, doesn't belong to the common uh, way of doing things. He has also his earphones, and of course, he is always with his uh, iPad or tablet. And if we transport this teenager in time, when they're in front of the tent of meeting, and because his information, his Google is keeping telling him that there, in the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle, there is an energy, a source, there is a secret. But unfortunately, it's something that he doesn't like. The road or the way towards that secret is blocked. He is looking for answers, and I imagine that young man or teenager, which is asking for a priest, you have a secret here. You hide something. You should be more transparent and tell us what is there in the heart of the, most, uh, of the sanctuary. What do you hide in the most holy place? And of course, the priest has to disappoint this teenager because he doesn't know. He doesn't, uh, he didn't see, he didn't step in into the most holy place. But he intermediates a conversation with the high priest. And there stands the high priest. And the teenager is keeping saying that is not transparency here at the tent of meeting. You hide secrets. You have a, an important energy that all the other people should know about it. And he's asking, what do you see? How, what is there in the most holy place? Because all his data is pointing to a certain direction. In the most holy place, it's a shining light that you cannot come closer to it. But the high priest has a message to this teenager. I really I have to disappoint you. But when I enter there, when I come closer where it's God dwelling in the sanctuary, there is not such a shining light. It's not a tremendous energy, but it's more dramatic things going on there. What is in the most holy place? We have at least two places in the Bible where you can get closer to what was there. And one place, it's in 1 Kings chapter 8, when there is a transition from the tabernacle towards the temple. And there we are told that the priests, priests were ministering. They brought all the objects of the tabernacle into the temple. And when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled his temple. What is in the most holy place? It's a cloud. What is this cloud about? It's God's glory. But when we have to describe God's glory, the cloud, what words do we have to use in order to be as close as possible to what was going on there? You and me, we don't know. But there is someone that knows what is there. And then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in darkness. So, when God is there, is dwelling in the most holy place, is not a shining light, but it is Arafel, which we translate a thick darkness. What is God's glory? It's not a shining light, but it's a cloud, a thick darkness cloud. There is God. There he resides in the most holy place. We have another occurrence in the Bible. We can get the same similar idea. For instance, when people arrive at Sinai, 
The Bible tells us that people, they were gathered around the Mount of Sinai, but when the God's voice started to speak, people didn't support that, and they pushed Moses to go and to represent people. And when people remained at the distance, Moses approached the thick darkness and started to have communion with God in darkness. The same, el the same idea we have it revealed in the Day of Atonement service. In Leviticus 16, chapter, uh, verses 12 and 13, we are told that when the priest had to minister in the most holy place, he is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law, so that he will not die. Not only that is darkness in the most holy place, but in the only day when someone stepped in, he had to produce smoke, even more darkness. There was a life and death issue. He had to produce even more darkness. And we have in the Bible that God resides in this darkness and the question that arises now is, what does it mean for us today? And I suggest the following interpretation. The most holy place presents the drama of God. He experiences their loneliness. He is in a square, isolated by everyone, and the days are passing, the weeks are passing, and months are passing, and God resides in darkness. He's alone. He doesn't have anyone with him. He experiences loneliness. And that experience, the Bible tells us, was fulfilled when Jesus the Shekinah of God came and walked among us. We know this from the introduction of the Gospel of John, that when he stepped down, the Bible uses there, he tabernacled among us. He lived with his own. But we have a surprise. He came to his own, but they rejected him. And the journey of Jesus on this earth is that when he comes with the best intentions among men, he will experience loneliness. As in the old times, when people gave the most sacred space to God, but he felt ontologically alone. So Jesus, now when he comes on this earth, he experiences loneliness. He has 70 disciples with him, but there is a point in his ministry when they rejected him. And the closer we get to his end, Jesus is stepping in to the absolute loneliness. And we know that the 12 disciples were there with Jesus in Gethsemane, and he even had three close, very close friends, but in the darkest hour of his life, he was alone. And we know that at the cross, there was a moment when Jesus felt the pressure of absolute loneliness. At noon, Mark tells us, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And till during that time of darkness, three hours, for Jesus was still okay. But at the third hour, in the afternoon, when darkness started to fade away, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me? At cross, Jesus experiences absolute loneliness. But there is something there. 
also at the cross when Jesus experiences absolute uh, loneliness. In the Gospel of Mark, there is a very interesting reference that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw, saw how he died, he said, surely this man of the Son of God. In the Gospel according to Mark, there is a question that appears again and again. People try to decode his identity. And when he succeeds to, to, uh, to make steel the winds and the, uh, and the sea, they ask, who is this? What's, who, what identity? Who is representing Jesus? And later on, he's casting out demons. They raise up the same question in the book of Mark. No one pinpoints the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Even when Peter confesses about the identity of Jesus, he is still far away from this revelation that he is the Son of God. He recognizes Jesus as being Christ, the Anointed One, Messiah. But the only person that comes to this conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God, it is in that moment when Jesus was alone and the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. What did happen there? The way was now cleared. People could see what does it mean for our eyes when the Son of God is coming among us, is tabernacle among us. They see that he experiences for us absolute loneliness. So, in the most holy place, we have this revelation about God that when he, we offer him the best and he resides among us, he experiences loneliness. But not because he likes to be alone. And when we move forward to what is, to what is in, in the holy place, we find out that the two important objects of the table and candlestick, they present what is Jesus or what is God longing for ages. What is the table? And make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. What I like about this table, that this is a real table. It resembles the table that my mom is preparing when she hears that her son is coming home. It's a real table. He's fully prepared. The plates are there. The cups are there. The bread is there. It's always there. Because the table tells something about what God is longing for. The table has 12 pieces of bread. Because... So many sons God has. And there is a curiosity about this table. There are 12 because there are 12 sons. But where is the 13th portion? What, where is God there doing at the table? He is serving. He is so happy to see all his sons together that he is there with, to serve and to make sure that everyone has everything at the table. If I have to describe or to use a modern imagery, how can we interpret the table in the, in the holy place, that modern imagery should be 
uh, hunger strike. Why? Because you keep feeding. There is the bread of the presence. The bread belongs to God. But he still tells through the ages that he's not going to eat. He's not going to eat. He's refraining from eating. For one reason. Because he's protesting. Because he's in a hunger strike. He won't sit at the table until that time when all his sons are there. Then he can celebrate. He can start the banquet. What is the table? In the most holy place, he's alone. But in the holy place, he invites people to have communion. There will be a time when people can sit together, can experience together commun communion at the table. This is the character that Jesus revealed to us in the New Testament when he's all the time at the table eating. He is with people, and even those that they were not so well behaved, they like to stay with Jesus to eat in communion with him. And this the invitation becomes an eschatological one when it will be a time when we sit all together with Jesus at the heaven, in, in the heaven and he will serve us, everyone. This is the great feast, the great banquet that will uh, wait for each of us. But in the holy place, there is another invita invitation that we receive because there is a candlestick. It's a menorah. And when we look carefully at the description of the candlestick of menorah and make its flower-like cups, buds, blossoms, branches, almond flowers, buds, blossoms, branch. The passage is full with botanical language. language. Because that image of the candlestick, the one that is looking at it should see a tree that is flowering. Only that, that tree should be in fire. And that fire should not be quenched, should not stop uh, uh, in any case. What do we have here? The candlestick. It's a reminding of the burning bush. When there was a tree, and he didn't stop burning. And at that moment in time, something wonderful happened. God met Moses. And do you recall, right? Moses, Moses, let's have a true and honest and deep meeting. And they met each other. They knew each other. And we know that this has happened. Because in that occasion, God revealed his name, his character to Moses. What is the candlestick in the holy place? It's an invitation. Let's come and know each other. Come closer to the burning tree. So when you come closer, your life will be a fire that will never stop. In the holy place, God is inviting people to stop loneliness, to have communion. When we move to the courtyard and we discuss about the altar of the burnt offerings, we still learn something about the sanctuary as a drama. If in the most holy place we have the drama of God, I will argue that in the courtyard, there is the drama of man. Why? Because at that time, at that altar, a drama 
happened all the time. We lost so much the, uh, uh, what is to feel to bring a sacrifice. We are so far away from those times. But here and there in the Bible, we still have passages that help us a little bit to, to gain back what was lost. How did they feel? What kind of bonds did they connect with the animals? For instance, the Passover lamb. Do you remember that the commandment of God was that in the tenth day of this month, each of them shall take a lamb to a family? But pay attention. The lamb has to stay within that family for four days. What do you think that did happen? It was uh, nurtured by themselves was part of the family. A strong relationship was created. But then, but then, they had to take it to the altar. And if to that, up to that point, they were good, in a good relationship, they went to at the altar, and only one came home. The altar is presenting the drama of men. He remains alone. Another passage that shows again how strong bond was created in all times about the animals, sacrificial animals, and they have the story of uh, David and Nathan, in which that ewe lamb, um, he tended it, and it grew up together with him and his children. It used to share his morsel of bread, drink from his cup, and nestle in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And when this bond was destroyed, even his life was affected. At the altar, there were two that goes together but only one returns home. But the altar is portraying into the future a moment when the slain lamb in one day will be followed by those that took their life. And the drama in the sanctuary. It's like God is experiencing loneliness, man is experiencing loneliness, and the only way to destroy this cursed chain is to come together in the holy place, to have communion, to sit at the burning tree, to be closer to his presence. We'll move now forward and we'll approach sanctuary from another perspective, as a journey. I recall a time when, as an MA student, I asked, together with other colleagues, one of the, let's say, most esteemed professors at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, we asked him what, in his opinion, would be the key char characteristic of those that, let's say, pursue excellence in research, in scholarship. And um, the answer surprised me, but the answer is true, and it's applicable today. He told, of, let's say, 15 years ago, he told me, mobility and he was right we live in a global village right and we have to be ready to move from one place to another pastors know very well this feature they have always be ready to move and this idea of journey I find it very deep connected with our uh, topic today sanctuary and when we look at the motif of journey in the book of Exodus, we find out three elements that together 
they point into the same direction, that people should go into our journey. And we have first the battle for the journey. We have then Passover that marks the beginning of the journey. But even we are told what is the destination of their journey. Let's reflect on each of those together. From the beginning, we should tell that God is, that God is the most interested in the realization of the journey. And we know that because uh, in Exodus 4, 22, 23, we are told that the message that should be sent to Pharaoh is like, let my son go that he may worship me. God wants his people to be in a journey. He is fighting for this journey. And the more we advance in the book of Exodus, we figure out that the plagues are coming and a strong hand uh, presses Pharaoh to let people go in the journey. But there is a battle. Pharaoh wants to affect this journey. And the first way how she tries to compromise this journey is to suggest that you, don't, you shouldn't go where you want to go, but to stay in the land. Do not go far away. This is when the swarms of insects started to, to, to invade uh, Egypt. But then Pharaoh forgets about it, and at the eighth plague, he comes with another proposal. You should go in the journey, but only you, menfolk. As far as your kids, your wives, your old men, they should le be left in Egypt. But then the journey has its rules. You have to take the journey together. And they argue, we cannot go into the journey that way. Then Pharaoh, the ninth plague, the darkness, Go, he says, worship the Lord, but leave behind your flocks and your herds. But again, Moses and Aaron, they argue, we have to go with our resources, everything we have to invest in this journey. Nothing we leave in Egypt. And we know it followed the 10th plague or the Passover, where we find a strong connection between the Passover and the journey motive. When we refer to the way the Passover lamb was prepared, what is striking us is the way that the lamb is prepared. Should be roasted. Head, legs, entrails, it should be eaten in one house. You should not boil it, anything with water. And the, the, the question is, why should prepare in such a strange way? Since, for instance, when you prepare an animal, first thing you take out are the uh, not, uh, inside parts. But there is a reason for that, that it's appearing again to the next element that appears in the Passover ritual, the unleavened bread. The Egyptian urged the people on, impatient to have them have the, uh, to have them leave the country. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before, uh, before it was leavened their kneading bowls wrapped in their cloaks upon their shoulders. Why they started to have unleavened bread attached to the Passover festival? Because the third element that happened in that night, it's about how you should anticipate that night. This is how you shall eat it. 
your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it, it hurriedly. It is a Passover offering to the Lord. Why do not boil it? And why to roast it? Why to have unleavened bread? For one reason, the journey, when you have to engage yourself into the journey, you have to hurry. There is haste. You don't have time to waste. Now is time when you have to start the journey. Bible gives us also the destination point of this journey. And it's fascinating to contemplate on it. When there are at the Red Sea, and when the waters uh, make room for them to cross, now looking back of what God has done for them, they realize what is the destination of their journey. In your love, you led the people you redeemed. In your strength, you guide them to your holy abode. Does someone know what is the holy abode that is Muslim referring here? If there is confusion, there is a clearer verse. In the same song of Moses, you will bring them and plant them in your own mountain. The place, there is a Hebrew term, Mahon. You made to dwell in, O Lord, the sanctuary, Migdash, O Lord, which your hands established. Do you see? God fights for this journey. They want people to hurry up to start the journey. And they receive also the destination point, which is in your Mikdash, in your temple, that your hands have made it. Do you know where is this mountain? It's in heaven. But now, something exceptional has happened. God gave them a space, a tabernacle, so that the journey that they had to go through to be remembered again and again. And the way that we travel through uh, into the sanctuary, we find stage, stages of this journey that they had to go through. For instance, the first cultic object that we have in the sanctuary, there is the altar. And the altar there is to signal to everyone that the beginning of the journey was at that time when they experienced Passover. But Passover was just the beginning of the journey because God wanted his people to go through the Red Sea. And the labor is there in the sanctuary to remind people that they had to go through the Red Sea. And then we get to the table. And the table there recalls a very important moment that happened at the foot of the mountain. When Moses, Aaron, and 70 elders, they were at the foot of the mountain. They ate and drank. They saw God and they realized you can sit with God at the table. That table is there at the foot of the mountain. Also, the foot of the mountain, it's a burning tree. There is the candlestick and recalls the meeting between Moses and God at the foot of the mountain, at the place where God told to Moses, you'll see, you'll come with your people and you'll worship me here. Altar of incense is to produce smoke the upper part of Sinai because the journey will end there 
on the top of the mountain, where is the ark where the Ten Commandments were received from God. So, the book of Exodus embeds the journey motif. And in the first part of the book, what we have as a journey through, where it's a battle for this journey, the cultic objects at the end of the book is nothing else than uh, reviewing or uh, recapitulating the journey. There are some implications for that. Sanctuary freezes the story of a people in motion towards the mount of God. And when they worshiped here, they had to remember that the destination point is the heavenly mountain, is the heavenly temple, the temple that God made with his own hands. And through daily ritual or yearly ritual, they have to revive their journey in the past. And lastly, it is very important to, to make the point that this order of the objects tells something about us. That when we start our journey, our journey starts with the gospel, with the altar. And then when we know what God has done for us, how he took us out from the bondage of sin, we respond going through water, that's baptism. Then we nourish our life with his presence, with his bread, because in one day we will arrive on God's mountain. We will see face to face uh, there where God lives. And the last part of my presentation, it's about sanctuary as a repository of memories. Everyone has a phone, right? And the most appreciated feature of a phone is to have a strong camera. Because our society today loves ways of keeping memories, taking a picture, freezing a moment over the past. But do you know? first that had this idea was God himself. And sanctuary can be treated as a repository of memories. When we look at the furniture that we have in the sanctuary, the altar of sacrifices I alluded to, it refers of the memory of Passover. The labor, it refers to that event when they crossed the Red Sea and the table when they saw God and could eat. And Menorah, when the burning bush was there and God called Moses and the incense altar to keep the memory of that smoke that was there at the Mount of Sinai and the Ten Commandments to remember that we received uh, from God his words, living words, but not only that, other objects entered into sanctuary. We know that the bowl with manna, when you witness with your eye that God is so good to feed you in the wilderness, that is transformed in a memory. You have to deposit it in the sanctuary. Bronze sheets in number 16. When people struggle for authority and they look for what is, um, higher, which is higher than the other one, then branches were put on the altar to remember them. That when you look at the altar, perhaps servant leadership is the best answer when there is a fight for authority. Aaron's staff had to be deposited also in the sanctuary. The book of law, when the covenant was renewed, has been deposited again there. The law of the king, even the Goliath's sword, we find it there. What is sanctuary? It's a place where memories are piled up. Why? Because from this angle, sanctuary tells us something about how to see history. We have nothing to fear for the future except 
as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. And I conclude that sanctuary as a story told in the form of a drama, journey, and, memo uh, and memories that we should carry on are aspects that we can connect with what is very important for the postmodern man. And we can teach sanctuary in a relevant way. Thank you very much for your attention, and God bless you.